Hi everyone, my name is Alec Davis, founder of MediatorAcademy.com, home of the passionate mediator. You know what we do on here, we interview the very best mediators and thought leaders from right around the world. This is the place for us to learn about new opportunities in our field, as well as how to overcome some of the challenges and dilemmas of life as a mediator, so that we can learn, grow and improve our effectiveness. All right, the big question for today's interview is this. How do we innovate our justice system to, to make it more accessible, affordable, and sustainable? Now, my guest is an author, speaker, and independent advisor to major professional firms and to national governments. His main area of expertise is the future of professional service and, in particular, the way in which the IT and the internet are changing the work of lawyers. He has worked on legal technology for over 30 years. He lectures internationally, has written many books and advised on numerous government inquiries. He is IT advisor to the Lord Chief Justice and is the chair of the Civil Justice Council's Online Dispute Resolution Advisory Group. It's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Richard Suskind onto Mediator Academy. Richard, welcome. Great pleasure to be with you. Richard, you've been working diligently now for some time uh, looking into the potential for ODR to handle civil disputes up to the value of about £25,000 uh, as part of this sort of ODR, ODR advisory group at the uh, Civil Justice Council. And I know you've reached some conclusions and I'm itching to find out more. Um, but before we get into that, could you set, set the scene, say a little bit more about the group, the kind of thinking, the processes you've gone through and why you feel the justice system needs to innovate? Oh, there's so many ways I could uh, delve into the subject. I want to say immediately that although I've been working fairly hard at it, uh, also the group has been working very hard. We were a group that was essentially set up by the Civil Justice Council, and we were asked over a period of nine months to look at the potential and the limitations of the use of online dispute resolution for the resolution of the low-value civil claims, really given quite a... a broad scope, I suppose, to delve into the subject of ODR. And in the end, actually, we took uh, quite a broad view of what that concept involves. Probably best for me to rewind about three decades, though, because I've been banging on about the use of technology in the court system for many years, and uh, I think it's probably fair to say without a huge deal of success. The, the court system, uh, it's a conservative beast, and there's broadly two things you can do with technology in the courts. The first is you can essentially graft on technology to the current way of working. So you can say, here's our court system, here's the pre-existing, often inefficient manual process, and why can't we use technology? It's document intensive, it's information intensive, there must be scope for better use of systems and better communications and so forth. And that's frankly been the way in which technology has been used in most court systems around the world. But in common with most public sector systems, indeed quite a lot of private sector systems around the world too, big technology projects have often disappointed. And in the end, I think what you get from this application of technology to the current or pre-existing systems is what I call mess for less. Because you've inherited an old-fashioned system, you graph technology on top of it, and not really sure you make fundamental change. The very interesting thing about ODR was it really gave us the opportunity to start with a blank sheet of paper. What if you actually didn't have physical courtrooms at all? Mm. What if you could get away with the idea of suggesting that court's not so much a, a place but a service? How could we use a whole bundle of emerging technologies to help people resolve their differences in a new way? So rather than graph things, I say the old technology, the new technology onto the old ways of working, we really start afresh. And this, I think, afforded us a great opportunity to think differently, not just about dispute resolution, but about access to justice more generally. Yeah. So, uh, so you formed this group made up of a, a number of um, academics, experts in the field. And um, what, what sort of thinking have you done? And I mean, you talked about starting with a blank sheet of paper. Um, you know, and I think that, uh, anyone developing technology or innovating, um, you know, when you've, you've got a legacy system in place, it's, you know, you, you have the benefit of being able to start with that sort of blank sheet of paper. Um, you know, how, how have you gone about thinking this through? Well, 
should say a little bit about the group because uh, a little bit of a dream team. I was lucky uh, that I asked a number of people who are, frankly, more expert than I am in online dispute resolution, people who've written doctorates in the subject, people who've been engaged in actual live use of systems. We assembled a team, a mixture of academics and practitioners, uh, people from the public sector too, and I thought a fairly good cross-section uh, of individuals who have both experience and enthusiasm about the, the use of ODR. I think it's to say, it's fair to say we had a couple of skeptics there as well, people who would uh, keep us uh, in line when we got too enthusiastic. But the idea was broadly a group of people who were sympathetic to draw on a number of techniques that seem to have worked elsewhere and say, could this work in the justice system of England and Wales? A fundamental question you need to ask, I, I think, is um, for what problem is the court a solution, as it were? Rather than thinking, what is the court just now? How do we improve it? We have to take a step back and ask ourselves, what are the fundamental problems uh, that give rise to the need for a court system in the first place. And the obvious answer to that is dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. But as a group, uh, and I have to say I, I, I did lead this aspect of the discussion, uh, I wanted to widen this. When I was an IT advisor to Lord Wolfe in the mid-90s in his Access to Justice inquiry, I always said to him, and I, I think he broadly accepted this, that uh, the way that judges look at access to justice and improving access to justice is really improving access to dispute resolution. How do we have cheaper, quicker, less combative, more convenient resolution of disputes in the courts? And I argue that there's actually two further layers that we need in a justice system. One I call dispute containment. So if you assume a dispute has actually arisen, how do we actually put a lid on it? How do we prevent it from escalating? How do we contain it? And very often I'm afraid to say that the involvement of lawyers in the courts tends to give rise to escalation rather than containment. But we should surely in our justice system have measures and mechanisms in place to help disputes from spiraling out of control and certainly beyond the pockets of participants. And then even before that is what I call dispute avoidance. I sometimes say it's putting a fence at the top of the cliff rather than an ambulance at the bottom. Because if we're really honest and we take this step back that I'm asking us to do, forget that we're mediators, forget that we're lawyers, forget that we're judges, actually most people don't want to dispute at all. I'm yet to meet a person who would like a, a big dispute or would prefer a big dispute well resolved by lawyers or mediators to not having a dispute at all. That's not how rational, normal, non-lawyers think about the world. Yeah. And we have to think a little bit like rational, uh, non-lawyers if we're really going to put in place something that works. So one of our starting points was to think, how could we have a system that doesn't just help resolve disputes, but can actually help contain disputes and indeed help us avoid disputes in the first place. So that was a broadly, uh, broadly speaking, a little bit of a philosophical discussion okay. about what it is that we have courts for and whether or not we can think in, in broader terms. Uh, and we believe it is incumbent on those who are making policy in the justice area to strive now to find ways of containing and avoiding disputes in the first place. So that was some of the, the underlying, if I can put it that way, philosophical thinking. Then what we had to do was uh, really build our collective experience and insight into what had been attained worldwide in the field of online dispute resolution, okay. ODR. And it's, uh, it's a field that's been around for well over a decade. There's uh, a small community of very enthusiastic individuals. And we come to the field, as most people do, with some dramatic stories. For example, that eBay, every year there are 60 million disputes on eBay. None of them are sorted out in the court system, or almost none. Uh, almost all of them sorted out by some form of online negotiation mm -hmm. or online uh, adjudication. So you see some track record there that this, uh, this technology, okay for a, a certain kind of fairly limited dispute, uh, but certainly uh, effective within, within its own boundaries. And so we thought what we really needed to do was immerse ourselves more deeply and uh, uh, a few people on the team went off and pulled together what eventually became in our report a set of case studies, uh, punchy, practical commentaries on what had actually been achieved in a number of other countries, Holland, Germany, Canada and within the UK as well. Yeah. So we had our philosophical point of view, uh, we also had a sense of what ODR could uh, achieve in practice. Yeah. and. What we really then wanted to do was come up with some practical suggestions uh, about what could be done uh, to improve the justice system. And remember our focal point here was low value claims in the civil system. Yeah. And our feeling was that the, the current system, it just seemed to us it was too costly, too slow, too complex, 
too forbidding for most individuals. So if you've got a claim for a few hundred pounds, maybe going through the small claims path, you really don't want, surely, to have to get heavily involved in difficult legal processes and have it resolved many months down the road. You want something, it seemed to us, that was uh, quicker and, and less painful. And so we're not suggesting that what we are putting in place is going to be wildly better than the best judge sitting in the courtroom. What we're trying to do is advocate some use of technology for the resolution of disputes that's proportionate. Given the nature and scale of so many hundreds of thousands of small disputes in our country, can we find a, a cheap and cheerful but yet quick and just way of delivering some kind of dispute resolution? So that that was the challenge. Yeah. And we as a group sat around for, uh, I think our first meeting was many, many hours where we in a fairly free format uh, brainstormed and uh, we did that a couple of times. We divided and conquered. Some of us looked at uh, past case studies. Some of us thought through the philosophy. Others looked at the legal and the po policy issues. Uh, others, and I was one of these, who looked at what technologies might come through in the future, mm. uh, future generations of ODR. And probably the most successful meeting we had was our second meeting. We set ourselves the task of uh, each of us uh, in pairs undertaking work. We came together and everyone wrote really good working papers, which will be on our website. And, uh, and from that, actually, both consensus emerged and a fair idea of, of what ODR might look like in practice. Now, for many people, and we don't really want to get bogged down in definitional issues of what ODR is, or um, uh, but many people say it's online ADR, fair enough. Uh, other people have identified some specific techniques, e-mediation, e-negotiation, e-adjudication, and so forth. We really took a rather broader view quite early on our thought was, how can you use technology to help solve disputes, but not necessarily using technology to streamline the existing court system. Yeah. So we're not really interested in, in virtual court, which is the idea of putting a camera in an existing court system, or case management for our current court system. We're really interested in new ways of using technology to resolve disputes. And if the purist wants to say that's not ODR, we're not too bothered. Yeah. Really, our passion is, and it really reflects your own passion, I think, how can we use technology to sort out disputes of, a, of low value in a way that's quick, fair, inexpensive, and allows people to go on with their lives? And what, what you're describing sounds, I mean, sounds like a disruptive technology, right? Yes, in the jargon, it's interesting. Uh, it's one of my interests. Uh, Clayton Christensen, who's a business school professor in Harvard, distinguishes between sustaining and disruptive technologies. Sustaining technologies are technologies that support and enhance the way that some particular industry or organization or business has always worked. And disruptive technologies are technologies that come along and fundamentally challenge or change that particular industry or sector. Mm. So what we are saying, I suppose, is disruptive, if we're honest, both for traditional lawyers and for traditional judges. If you're in the business, in low value civil claims, of being the lawyer who represents the client and assembling in the physical courtroom or judging the physical courtroom, then potentially what we're seeing is disruptive. But there's another way of looking at it because there's two different markets here. On the one hand, there's the question, how do we resolve disputes that are perhaps inefficiently resolved today? How do we resolve them more efficiently? Question one. Mm -hmm. But actually my bigger interest is what I call the latent legal market or unmet legal need. How do we provide a mechanism to help people resolve disputes where these disputes today simply go either unnoticed or when they are recognized, the people just don't believe the justice system for them. It's unaffordable, it's too forbidding, it just doesn't seem uh, accessible. So it's not just about saving costs, although we think we absolutely can do that, saving costs the traditional system, it's widening access. And when you get into the business of offering access to dispute resolution where none existed before, mm. then that disrupts no one. Mm. Uh, so it's partly disruptive and partly, frankly, empowering. Yeah. And you, you talked about the sort of philosophical basis for your work, mm. and you described um, sort of uh, conflict resolution, um, conflict containment, containment mm. and av avoidance. Yeah. Um, say a little bit more about those three different strands and how those kind of put have put a structure on, on your thinking. Well, what actually happened from these three layers, as it were, we concluded that what an online court should look like, and our fundamental recommendation is that the government should set up an online court, is a, a three-tiered court. 
And the first tier, the top tier, should help with dispute avoidance. The second tier should help with dispute containment. And the third tier should help with dispute resolution. So starting at the bottom, as it were, the third tier, dispute resolution, our recommendation is that judges, proper full-time uh, Her Majesty's judges, should sit and decide some cases on an online basis, by which we mean in the first generation of these systems, they will decide cases on the papers alone, and if necessary, mm. through some kind of telephone conference call with the parties involved. Nothing smarter than that. So that's the, the lower tier, the third tier, but that's the tier of last resort. Okay. If, you go, if you go up a level, uh, and we're making a recommendation here that we think is quite um, innovative for the justice system, we recommend the introduction of a new sort of court official that we call the facilitator. Okay. Now, we've been very much impressed here by the work of the Financial Ombudsman Service, and you may know that they receive about hundreds of thousands of disputes every year, and only about 10% of these disputes actually reach the ombudsman themselves. 90% of them are handled by what they call adjudicators. And they're individuals uh, who, in our language, um, rather than participating in an adversarial trial where they, they don't sit as judges, it's more inquisitorial. They poke and prod, they make inquiries. It's a whole bundle of ADR techniques rolled into one, as I understand it. And this is certainly what we recommend for facilitators. So the facilitators are there to identify, understand, categorize, classify uh, the, the particular problems that are coming through. If, frankly, it's absolutely clear that this is not the case that should reach a, a judge at all, then they'll advise in that way. Uh, they'll poke and prod and make inquiries and try to get a clearer picture themselves of what the issues are, what the merits are, and so forth. The so whole mixture and bundle, and I say this in a fairly unstructured way so far, but the whole theme is having this level of facilitators who act as a kind of filter, okay. so that we hope that many disputes that would hitherto have gone through to a physical uh, resolution in a courtroom for a judge will actually be settled online by a facilitator on papers or perhaps again through telephone conferencing call. And the level above that, actually, um, even earlier, that's the dispute avoidance uh, level. We call this online evaluation. And what we want to do there, and it's partly, we believe, a, this is a collaborative project, we believe, between the online court and uh, perhaps the, the voluntary sector as well, where we should have online guidance, online advice, online diagnostics to help individuals themselves understand their entitlements, try to classify and categorize what kind of problem they have, mm. understand what options are available to them, uh, what remedies might be available to them, and in many cases we hope uh, just having an understanding of one's position and options will avoid uh, having a, a dispute in the first place. So online evaluation is the top level, the first level one comes across, mm -hmm. and that is essentially uh, online assistance. Yeah. And as I say, partly we believe should be offered or at least uh, hosted by the online court, but there are so many very useful websites already out there. And in due course, you'll have things like useful diagnostic expert systems, which will ask people a series of questions, and out will come some kind of preliminary recommendation. But if you don't actually think there's a way to avoid your problem, you'll then proceed to the online facilitator, and if that doesn't work, on to the online judge. There are three tier court matching the online, uh, sorry, online evaluation, online containment, uh, uh, and uh, online resolution. Yeah. A different model. The two innovations there, therefore, Uh, the first is that judges are actually deciding cases on an online basis. That hasn't happened in this country. Yeah. And the second is that for certain types of civil action or civil claims, uh, in the first instance, we try to dispose of them uh, through the use of facilitators rather than judges. Yeah. And so it sounds like then, certainly the top tier is uh, consistent with this uh, idea or aspiration to, to improve access to justice. It's giving people the tools, the, uh, the ability to uh, learn, develop their thinking about their own uh, predicament, their own dilemma, their own situation, uh, so they can make better choices, more informed choices, and not feel like there's a barrier to enter this process. I oh, that's right. I imagine there'll be a, a, a you know, free to access that information. The, the top level we are envisaging, there's no fee. Yeah. Uh, level two, the, tier two, there would be, tier three, there would be. I think the style and interface of these systems would have to be considerably friendlier than a lot of uh, 
uh, the, the interface that one comes across just now between uh, clients and lawyers and clients in the courts. So I think it is, uh, it, it's animations and it's, uh, it's friendly diagrams, it's flow charts, it, it's bullet points. This is not large bodies of impenetrable text. So what we hope is that it's a welcoming, um, uh, affordable, in the sense it's costing nothing, but cl a clearly intelligible uh, set of guidelines for people who, who need help. And we have in mind a lot of the time litigants in person for whom, as, as we know, uh, going through the court process can be terribly difficult. We, our intuition is that a, a user-friendly online service might be more convenient, less forbidding, uh, and more intelligible to the litigants in person. Yeah. And what, what are the sort of challenges do you envisage encountering trying to get this uh, implemented over the next few years? Uh, where, where do I start? Um, I think the first thing to say is that of all the projects I've been involved in over the last 38 years in technology in the courts, uh, this is the one I'm most excited and optimistic about. And it's partly because there's remarkable support coming from the senior judges. If you didn't have support from senior judges and all of this, this really would be uh, a, a project with very little future. Mm. Um, secondly, I, I'm optimistic about the, the new wave of, of policy makers. Uh, thirdly, we, we're making, we're, our report calls for all party support. We don't see this as party political. We can't see any political party would not want to increase access to justice and save costs in the court system. So we, we think the proposition is quite attractive. In our report, uh, we quote a man called Samir Gray, who is a very eminent physician. And he says of the NHS at one point, he says, we're not going to change until we run out of money. And to some extent, that's where we're at with the justice system. If our conventional system was entirely affordable, this is not a comment on legal aid. Yeah. Uh, if, if the system was proportionate and affordable and intelligible, uh, then and there was no no problems, as I say, about cash. I don't think there'd be no real imperative to bring about this change. But we are, it seems to me, in a stage where people simply cannot afford uh, legal services, uh, and that even before legal aid problems, the cost of pursuing a small claim, for example, was disproportionate to the amount at issue. And so it just seems to me that the, the business case, as it were, is, is fairly compelling. So support from the judges, support from officials, we hope support from the politicians. At a time where, frankly, we're running out of options, mm. uh, I'm optimistic. And another dimension to all of this is that we're making this recommendation to a society in which around 80% of people are pretty sophisticated internet users. Yeah. If we'd been making this recommendation three or four years ago, as frankly I was and have been for many years, people were saying, yeah, I get it, but actually there's lots of people who don't use the internet and this is just going to be a new form of uh, uh, exclusion. But now we really are, at the, and the research shows this, we have about 80% of people who are actually using the internet. And of that remaining 20%, uh, people who aren't users know someone who is. So granny might not really use the internet, but her grandchildren and children certainly do. And so we're at a time where I think for the internet generation, if we're thinking of our legacy, what the next generation of people will use for resolving disputes, uh, I think we're at a time where people are saying, is, is it really is it really sustainable to assemble physically in a wood panelled room X months down the road to sort out a dispute of this size? Mm. And we think not. And uh, we think for the next generation, online dispute resolution will just become a very, very natural facility. Far more natural, far more intuitively plausible and appropriate than the physical courtroom. Yeah, and what's, what's the time scale then for the implementation of, of something like this? I mean, what are your plans in terms of developing a pilot? Or Yeah, very much. A, what we recommend, and I suppose it's our, our biggest recommendation, is that the court service, the court tribunal service, um, take online dispute resolution into part of their ongoing civil reform program. And we're very much hoping in 2015-2016 there will be a series of pilots. And we look at a variety of areas which are possible uh, domains for piloting and with a view, we hope, to some kind of launch in 2017. At a certain stage, of course, as an advisory group, we lose a grip of the management of the process. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Civil Justice Council uh, have uh, supported our ongoing activity, so we're going to be looking in greater depth at, for example, what rules will be what rules of court will, will, will be required for online dispute resolution, what enabling technologies will be most appropriate, what areas of 
dispute are best suited to this kind of technology and so forth. There's a chunk of work still to be done, and we hope, therefore, uh, to do this uh, to help the, the court services, they themselves think how best to implement this. Yeah, so it's likely that a pilot will probably focus on a particular type of dispute. Yeah, the, the example we give in, in our, our report is small claims. Okay. It's just say claims under £10,000, yeah. where really the amount at issue is modest and to instruct lawyers and to use court time, judge time and so forth, uh, doesn't seem a proportionate way to proceed. We also looked at uh, landlord and tenant disputes, we looked a little at road traffic disputes, and intuitively uh, these very large areas of, uh, of dispute, uh, areas of dispute seem to us to be uh, appropriate too. But we didn't want to, it's too early until one pilots really to say this area is definitively appropriate and suitable uh, and this area is not. So we have to identify what it is, what characteristics of disputes will make them most suitable for this kind of treatment. That's important piece of work. Yeah. But I'm anxious and I know the group is anxious that we don't uh, we don't hang around. So I want to say that there are very little reason, looking at what other jurisdictions have done, that we couldn't get uh, this up and running by 2017. Yeah. So. So, uh, Richard, what are the implications of this on the uh, on mediators and the ADR community, community more broadly? It wasn't really within the scope of our, our work to look at that question specifically, but I think a message emerges fairly clearly that the kinds of tools we're talking about for use within the courts should equally be used by the ADR community itself. It seems to me people are disappointed, and some are, by the uptake, for example, of mediation in certain sectors. Uh, and this is my own personal intuition, one wonders if mediation, it's certainly true of arbitration, has become quite court-like. For the, for the average non-lawyer, I'm not sure they know the difference between a judge, indeed a lawyer, an ombudsman, an arbitrator, a mediator, all looks pretty official to them. And I'm not sure assembling in a, a room with someone, whether or not they're mediating or adjudicating or whatever it is they're doing, someone who seems to know more than everyone else, whether that's sufficiently different from the conventional court process to be distinctive in the way that I believe the original was uh, the original ethos of, uh, of, of ADR. And so my gut reaction is that what will really kickstart ADR like nothing else, kickstart probably the wrong phrase, it's already up and running, mm. will turbocharge ADR, perhaps is a better way of putting it, uh, is actually delivering mediation online, negotiating online, um, using all the t techniques that have been evolved and, uh, and honed over the years uh, for ADR specialists but actually making some kind of virtual experience. Uh, and so that's where I think ODR and ADR come together, that what ODR is offering is a new channel a new mechanism for delivering uh, EDR services. And my guess is that uh, when mediators start to embrace online techniques, virtual hearings, ODR and so forth, this will give, uh, I think, a great, great boost to, to those who are involved with EDR. Yeah, very interesting. I know a few mediators that are uh, very busy doing online mediation. Mm -hmm. And not just uh, you know in, in, a, in a Skype forum, but the synchronous text. Yeah. just facilitating discussions between parties from different parts of the world. Yeah, I think it's important to say it's not simply uh, uh, sitting at Skype and chatting to people. What we will really want is an, an entire environment where people will be able to uh, submit their thinkings and there can be a, there'll be a multimedia dialogue. And the, the screen and the system will be designed in a way that people feel they're engaged as part of a serious process. So although actually there is some mileage uh, even today in having Skype calls, uh, I have no doubt. I have in mind something that's more of a, a, a hearing room environment that we haven't yet designed. We did some research to find if anyone had done this and we couldn't really find anywhere around the world, uh, somewhere where a, a mediator or a, an adjudicator could sit online uh, with facilities around them and give the feeling to the users uh, of weight and substance that things necessary to the process. But that, that mm -hmm. I think will be, as I say, a great boost to the ADR community. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. You know, and thinking about the generation that will be accessing this stuff in years to come, you know, uh, their familiarity with the technology, picking up a, a a tablet, a phablet, a device of some kind, and interacting with someone that will be the norm. The idea of going to, as you said, a, a wooden panelled room 
will be alien to the vast majority of a population in 10, 20 years' time. So, you know, we need to adapt. I think you could have better than I do. It's, it's, it's precisely the point. It's, I don't think our court system, or frankly our EDR system, is fit for purpose for the internet generation. Mm. The internet generation would have to be far more electronic online engagement because it's affecting all other aspects of our lives. So somehow, I think, to retain credibility, the legal process has to engage too. Yes, absolutely. And technology, um, Mediator Academy, for example, we've got mediators in Cambodia watching these interviews that mm. couldn't dream of getting access to some of the, the thought leaders that we've interviewed on this. Mm. Um, and it's just amazing the scalability, but how the, the, the reachability of the, uh, of the internet and technology is fantastic. Yeah, I think the other interesting thing is, although our recommendation is largely for, uh, in fact, entirely for the uh, public sector service, there is a fairly active and competitive private sector online dispute resolution community. Mm -hmm. And I think over the next five years or so, we'll see some pretty impressive uh, systems and platforms emerging. There already are some, but what was more competition, uh, and I think it will become fiercely competitive because the, the global market for dispute resolution is not small. Yeah. Do you do you have a vision, you know, sort of ten years from now of a, a, a justice system? And if you do, what is that? You know, that sort of magic wand idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not sure about my vision. Well, I am sure about my vision. I'm not sure this is the place to discuss my vision. But what we said in our report about online dispute resolution is we could see two later generations of systems. The first generation is when this becomes video enabled. So you remember I said that judges will decide cases in the early days on the papers alone and perhaps by a telephone conference call. The next generation of system, probably clicking in about 2018, 2019, uh, realistically, um, will be using high quality video techniques. We've got a whole lot of things to do there in terms of setting up what would be an appropriate online environment, a sufficient gravitas that has appropriate trappings. Um, so that's an old-fashioned technology called the telephone. I can't pretend it can ring. So the, the video conference will have this facility uh, essentially embedded in the ODR process. And that'll widen the number of disputes that can be sorted. Because there'll be a number of disputes people will say, well, excuse me, it's the phone again. A number of disputes people will say, it's, not, it's simply not appropriate not to meet in person. So we'll say, actually, well, why can't you use video conferencing for that technique instead? And that's the second generation. The third generation's where we use artificial intelligence. That'll click in in the 2020s. We're, at, and we're not saying, and we genuinely aren't saying here that this will replace judges, but you'll have intelligent assistance, systems yeah. that can actually uh, take the data from online forms that people have filled in, and we'll be able to undertake some kind of diagnostics as well. We'll have big data clicking in, so we'll mm -hmm. have hopefully lots of information about past cases and likely outcomes, which will help people and guide people on future probable decisions and so forth. So the first generation, very straightforward and simple, uh, deciding cases on the papers, supported by telephone conferencing, the second generation video conferencing, and the third generation some kind of uh, AI. Yeah, I've got to ask you now that you've, uh, um, okay, that's the vision of the group. What's your vision? Oh, well, um, uh, thinking about that a lot, now I'm writing a new book with my uh, older son, which is called The Future of the Professions. So we're looking a lot at uh, the latest generation of artificial intelligence and so forth. I've been saying for some years, and, and I, I joke I write the same book every every four years, but uh, I'm just, it's just the technology changes. So I've got new examples of, uh, of, of, of the principles uh, that, I, that I'm laying forth. Uh, it seems to me that in the law and in judging generally, we have to accept that much of the activity that we used to think was uniquely the province of human beings will increasingly be taken on by machines. So I'm, I'm very much of the view in the world of artificial intelligence, and I'm not really talking about timescales here, but uh, I think if you have a look at the achievements in big data, if you look at achievements of something like IBM Watson, yeah. if you look at what's happening in robotics, you'll see that many human tasks will be better discharged by computers. Mm -hmm. But there's a very interesting, so I, if, if you think in, in law of, for example, review of documents, it's already pretty well established that if you've got a large number of documents to review in terms of precision and recall, intelligent systems and predictive coding and these kind of techniques, uh, essentially systems are outperforming junior lawyers and paralegals. Yeah. And they're only going one direction, they're getting better and better. 
You think of the drafting of documents, you've got automatic document assembly. So huge numbers of documents, fairly really standard documents, will be generated by answering a series of questions on screen, outcomes of poly polish first draft. Now every area of legal practice you look, you look at, you can see chunks of it uh, that will be, it seems to me, discharged better by computers. Mm. There are some fascinating questions though about the extent to which even if you can replace some of the work of lawyers by, uh, or judges by computers, whether or not you ought to. Uh, and that's, and I've written for many years about this starting my doctorate in the 80s, about uh, really asking the questions, can, should computers replace judges? And this is absolutely not in the context of this ODR project. But even if they could, I think most of us wouldn't want, want them to. Who knows how we'll feel in 200 years' time. Yeah. Uh, but there, it, it does seem uh, important to us, I think, when we have uh, disputes between, between human beings that is actually another human being directly involved in, in some way in coming to some kind of authoritative binding uh, conclusion. But uh, as a generality, we are, I think, privileged, but it's quite scary, uh, to live in an era where many cognitive tasks, as well as clear, many physical tasks, uh, will be better undertaken by machines, which raises fascinating questions about what we'll all do with our time. But that's the that's the way the wind's blowing. Um, so I've said for many years, and I wrote a book called The End of Lawyers? Question mark that uh, once you look at legal work um, in a kind of manufacturing mentality, if you break down legal work into its component parts, you'll find that there will be better, and that'll be. Uh, uh, to a lower cost or to high quality, ways of undertaking work that wouldn't involve human beings. So, just as we've seen the Mercers, the Tallow Chandlers, and, and other crafts fade over the year, my guess is that the same will happen with the great, uh, much of the work that's done by lawyers. This is not over the next few years, folks. Uh, I'm really not saying that the end is nigh. I never have said that. Uh, but I think if you look, if you take a uh, if you're thinking 2040. Uh, it's pretty hard for me to imagine uh, the lawyers and judges will be conducting work in the way they do today. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, Richard, thank you very much. If people want to find out more about the report, where do they go? It's on the judicial website. Okay. Um, and hopefully there'll be quite a lot of publicity around this, so you just need to Google it. So it's the ODR report looking at low value civil claims, and we are the ODR advisory group of the Civil Justice Council. Wonderful. Richard, thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks very much.